you mentioned twice now recreational drug use. Can you say a little bit more about which recreational drugs uh, might um, be the driving feature if you're seeing otherwise unexplained elevations of LFTs? Yeah, I think this is um, came up a little bit, I think, when we talked about the viral hepatitis. Um, if your doctor asks you not just about what you're doing currently, but what you may have done in the 70s or 80s, um, when we talk about recreational drug use, that's oftentimes a risk factor, um, injection drug use, IV drug use, or intranasal cocaine um, that is shared between different individuals. There's a ton of people with undiagnosed hepatitis C um, that are picked up on screening exams. And the only thing we find is... Um, uh, drug use in, in the late eighties, et cetera. Mm. Um, back in the day before we screened, um, uh, blood products as well. Again, it's, it's really in, in sort of the seventh, eighth decade of life that I still see women, um, that may have had a hysterectomy. Um, so, so contaminated blood products. I'm just thinking through our, all our questions that I have Got to it. normalize for our patients, um, dental work abroad, um, contaminated types of things are, um, risk factors for various forms of viral hepatitis. Um, but that's, that's where that comes from. I see. I see. So it's, I, I under, yeah, got it. It's not that current use of pick your favorite drug, marijuana is necessarily hepatotoxic. You know, there are cannabinoid receptors and we, we come up against this question, um, infrequently, but no, it's not in terms of, of what you're asking about. And then again, you mentioned the use of lipid lowering agents. Uh, I would say the most predictable manner in which we see an elevation of transaminases is indeed with the addition of statins, especially if combined with uh, Zetia. So mm -hmm. I know that the general consensus is that unless the elevation is, you know, exceeds one and a half, maybe two X, the upper limit of normal, it's deemed not clinically relevant. Um, I'm not sure that's what I heard you say though. What I think I heard you say is the benefits outweigh the risks. And I think those are two different things, right? I mean, in other words, if a person takes, you know, Crestor and Zetia and their transaminases pre-therapy are in the twenties and post-therapy they're 50, I mean, Yes, there's probably there's I hope there's a reason they're taking Crestor and Zetia, and I hope that that um, speaks to a risk reduction that's significant with respect to ASCVD. But we shouldn't conclude from that that their liver is happy, should we? No, and I think this is where we sort of get into the full differences. If you're looking at a, a change from 19 to 25, 19 to 30, you know, you're still within the range of normal. I think most people would say risk benefit um, favors um, continuing on that on that um, lipid lowering agent. If you're persistently elevated, we've gone so far as to like, look with biopsies, et cetera. And in very rare circumstances, is there actual liver injury that's happening with some of these drugs? And I can count on one hand, how many times we've seen demonstrable liver injury that we think is associated with, um, one of these lipid lowering agents. The, the real summary point is that there's so many alternatives that oftentimes that we that don't induce um, or cause elevations um, that are well tolerated and have a either more potent um, lipid lowering effect or better tolerated by that person. So it depends on degree of elevation within the bounds of what we expect is sort of the upper limit of normal, mm -hmm. or is there some evidence of liver injury going on and is there an alternative? Yeah, I mean, we, we tend to be very aggressive on this, Julia. We, we don't really tend to like to tolerate elevations of the AST and ALT. And as you said, we obviously today have far more tools in our toolkit to, um, to get people off those drugs if, if that's what's happening. <laughs>